the hand of the clock reached the dot of eight o'clock. Ladies and gentlemen, said a voice that came from the radio receiver, a man's clear, calm, implacable voice, the kind of voice that had not been heard on the airwaves for years. Mr. Thompson will not speak to you tonight. His time is up. I have taken it over. You were to hear a report on the world crisis. That is what you are going to hear. Three gasps of recognition greeted the voice, but nobody had the power to notice them among the sounds of the crowd, which were beyond the stage of cries. One was a gasp of triumph, another of terror, the third of bewilderment. Three persons had recognized the speaker, Dagny, Dr. Stadler, Eddie Willers. Nobody glanced at Eddie Willers, but Dagny and Dr. Stadler glanced at each other. She saw that his face was distorted by as evil a terror as one could ever bear to see. He saw that she knew, and that the way she looked at him was as if the speaker had slapped his face. For twelve years you have been asking, Who is John Galt? This is John Galt speaking. I am the man who loves his life. I am the man who does not sacrifice his love or his values. I am the man who has deprived you of victims, and thus has destroyed your world. And if you wish to know why you are perishing, you who dread knowledge. I am the man who will now tell you. The chief engineer was the only one able to move. He ran to a television set and struggled frantically with its dots. But the screen remained empty. The speaker had not chosen to be seen. Only his voice filled the airways of the country. Of the world, thought the chief engineer, sounding as if he were speaking here in this room, not to a group, but to one man. It was not the tone of addressing a meeting, but the tone of addressing a mob. You have heard it said that this is an age of moral crisis. You have said it yourself, half in fear, half in hope that the words had no meaning. You have cried that man's sins are destroying the world, and you have cursed human nature for its unwillingness to practice the virtues you demand. Since virtue to you consists of sacrifice, you have demanded more sacrifices at every successive disaster. In the name of a return to morality, you have sacrificed all those evils which you held as the cause of your plight. You have sacrificed justice to mercy. You have sacrificed independence to unity. You have sacrificed reason to faith. You have sacrificed wealth to need. You have sacrificed self-esteem to self-denial. You have sacrificed happiness to duty. You have destroyed all that which you held to be evil and achieved all that which you held to be good. Why then do you shrink in horror from the sight of the world around you? That world is not the product of your sins. It is the product and the image of your virtues. It is your moral ideal brought into reality in its full and final perfection. You have fought for it. You have dreamed of it. You have wished it. And I, I am the man who has granted you your wish. Your ideal had an implacable enemy, which your code of morality was designed to destroy. I have withdrawn that enemy. I have taken it out of your way and out of your reach. I have removed the source of all those evils you were sacrificing one by one. I have ended your battle. I have stopped your motive. I have deprived your world of man's mind. Men do not live by the mind, you say. I have withdrawn those who do. The mind is impotent, you say. I have withdrawn those whose mind isn't. There are values higher than the mind, you say? I have withdrawn those for whom there are. While you were dragging to your sacrificial altars the men of justice, of independence, of reason, of wealth, of self-esteem, I beat you to it. I reached them first. I told them the nature of the game you were playing and the nature of that moral code of yours, which they had been too innocently generous to grasp. I showed them the way to live by another morality, mine. It is mine that they chose to follow. All the men who have vanished, the men you hated, yet dreaded to lose, it is I who have taken them away from you. Do not attempt to find us. We do not choose to be found. Do not cry that it is our duty to serve you. We do not recognize such duty. Do not cry that you need us. We do not consider need a claim. Do not cry that you own us. You don't. Do not beg us to return. We are on strike. We, the men of the mind. We are on strike against self-immolation. We are on strike against the creed of unearned rewards and unrewarded duties. We are on strike against the dogma that the pursuit of one's happiness is evil. We are on strike 
against the doctrine that life is guilt. There is a difference between our strike and all those you've practiced for centuries. Our strike consists not of making demands, but of granting. We are evil, according to your morality. We have chosen not to harm you any longer. We are useless, according to your economics. We have chosen not to exploit you any longer. We are dangerous and to be shackled, according to your politics. We have chosen not to endanger you, nor to wear the shackles any longer. We are only an illusion, according to your philosophy. We have chosen not to blind you any longer and have left you free to face reality, the reality you wanted, the world as you see it now, a world without mind. We have granted you everything you demanded of us, we who had always been the givers, but have only now understood it. We have no demands to present to you, no terms to bargain about, no compromise to reach. You have nothing to offer us. We do not need you. Are you now crying, no, this was not what you wanted? A mindless world of ruins was not your goal? You did not want us to leave you? You moral cannibals. I know that you've always known what it was that you wanted, but your game is up, because now we know it too. Through centuries of scourges and disasters, brought about by your code of morality, you have cried that your code had been broken, that the scourges were punishment for breaking it that men were too weak and too selfish to spill all the blood it required. You damned man. You damned existence. You damned this earth, but never dared to question your code. Your victims took the blame and struggled on, with your curses as reward for their martyrdom, while you went on crying that your code was noble, but human nature was not good enough to practice it, and no one rose to ask the question, good? By what standard? You wanted to know John Galt's identity. I am the man who has asked that question. Yes, this is an age of moral crisis. Yes, you are bearing punishment for your evil. But it is not man who is now on trial. And it is not human nature that will take the blame. It is your moral code that's through this time. Your moral code has reached its climax. The blind alley at the end of its course. And if you wish to go on living... What you now need is not to return to morality, you who have never known any, but to discover it. You have heard no concepts of morality but the mystical or the social. You have been taught that morality is a code of behavior imposed on you by whim, the whim of a supernatural power, or the whim of society, to serve God's purpose or your neighbor's welfare, to please an authority beyond the grave or else next door, but not to serve your life or pleasure. Your pleasure, you have been taught, is to be found in immorality. Your interests would best be served by evil, and any moral code must be designed not for you, but against you, not to further your life, but to drain it. For centuries, the battle of morality was fought between those who claimed that your life belongs to God and those who claimed that it belongs to your neighbors, between those who preached that the good is self-sacrifice for the sake of ghosts in heaven and those who preached that the good is self-sacrifice for the sake of incompetence on earth. And no one came to say that your life belongs to you and that the good is to live it. Both sides agreed that morality demands the surrender of your self-interest and of your mind, that the moral and the practical are opposites, that morality is not the province of reason but the province of faith and force. Both sides agree that no rational morality is possible, that there is no right or wrong in reason, that in reason there's no reason to be moral. Whatever else they fought about, it was against man's mind that all your moralists have stood united. It was man's mind that all their schemes and systems were intended to despoil and destroy. Now, choose to perish, or to learn that the anti-mind is the anti-life. Man's mind is his basic tool of survival. Life is given to him, survival is not. His body is given to him, its sustenance is not.